Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to welcome everyone here tonight. We're delighted to have our very own member, William Tenenbaum, to be our guest speaker tonight about his recently published book, which has a very interesting name. And the name of the book is Future Memories. So let me tell you a little bit about our wonderful member, besides being a wonderful human being and a passionate Zionist and someone who you could always see standing in shul with his long talus. Uh, and whenever he comes up for Misha Berach, he always insists that after he gets his, his aliyah, we make a special blessing for Tzahal, for the Israel Defense Forces and for the State of Israel. Uh, he is also uh, an author and his recently published book is a personal memoir. And we're going to uh, hear all about his story of his uh, ancestry. And we look forward to his presentation, which will be about 30 minutes, following which there'll be questions and answers. So as he's speaking, or when he concludes, feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we will have a conversation with Bill after the presentation. I also want to welcome his daughter, Ruthie, who's on um, line with us. And it's always a pleasure to see the Tenenbaum family. So um, our author this evening, uh, William Tannenbaum, was born in Brooklyn, New York. He received his BA from Columbia University, where he majored in art history and studied psychology with an emphasis on memory function. While in college, he developed a passion for travel. William has visited more than 50 countries studying their history and culture, and I had the pleasure of being in Israel with him on one of those trips. He has also visited all 50 states. For over 50, 40 years, he operated the residential mobile home parks here in Florida. William and his wife, Rana, currently reside in Boca Raton, Florida. We are proud to call him our friend and member. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you tonight, Mr. William Tannenbaum on his recent book, Future Memories. You're muted, you have to unmute. All right. Now you're good. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. And welcome, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you tonight about my book. And the, the book, the story of the teenage boys, basically is fiction. But the overriding part of the story is based on fact because during World War II, approximately 20,000, some estimates as high as 30,000 Jews went and lived in Shanghai during World War II to escape the Nazis in Europe. And the story about why they went to Shanghai is that Shanghai required no visa to get admission into the country. So if you could leave your country in Europe and get your way to Shanghai, you were away from the Nazis and safer than being killed by them or put into concentration camps. So the story is about three teenage boys and they leave Poland in early 1940. World War II began on September 1st, 1939. So this takes place just a few months after World War II started and the Germans had already bombed Poland and the Polish army surrendered after three weeks of fighting with the Germans. But the Germans had not yet occupied Poland. So these boys had the opportunity to leave. Reluctantly, they didn't really wanna leave because they would be leaving their parents and their grandparents family, aunts, uncles, cousins, 
friends, but they left and they traveled from Poland to Shanghai. The distance from Poland to Shanghai is approximately 4,800 miles. There was no plane travel. They traveled 4,800 miles by train, by horse-drawn covered wagon, by walking, and by boat. And one of the, the, the title of the book is Future Memories. And at the very beginning of the book, when these boys are on the train going from Poland to Hungary, one of the boys thinks back to his childhood and remembers one of the neighbors, the shoemaker's wife, who every Shabbos baked cookies to give out to the children and how many times he was there, never knowing it was going to be a last time, never knowing that it was going to be only a memory, a future memory. And he thinks of this while he's on the train. And then they have different incidents, episodes on their travel from Poland to Shanghai. It's not an easy journey. And others who are doing the same trek, some of them don't make it. Some of them are killed by Nazis, not German Nazis, Hungarian Nazis, Bulgarian Nazis, but many of them get killed along the way. And <clears throat> these boys get on a boat and sail to Shanghai, but they have a detour when a Japanese patrol boat intercepts their boat and brings them to Yokohama. And from Yokohama, some of the boys get to the US Embassy in Tokyo, where they're told that the America will not allow Jews into the country. This is 1940. And so they're back on the ship and sent to Shanghai. Now, an interesting part of the history is there were Jews living in Japan before the war started and when the war started. The Japanese did not kill any of those Jews deliberately. What they did is they put them all on ships and sent them all to Shanghai. So when the Germans said to the Japanese who were allies, the Germans said, we want you to get rid of all the Jews in Japan. And the Japanese said, we got rid of all the Jews in Japan. But each definition was different. And so the Jews who were living in Japan, besides those who were coming from other places, all wound up in Shanghai. And life wasn't easy. The Joint Distribution Committee tried to bring in supplies, bribe the Japanese soldiers who were occupying Shanghai to let the supplies in. Supplies meaning food, soap, clean water to drink. And life was difficult. And it wasn't just difficult for Jews, it was difficult for Chinese as well. And because of lack of medical facilities, typhus and cholera, and Japanese contributed nothing to the well being, but they didn't take machine guns and mow them down. And so this went on for the entire war 
And then when the war ended in 1945, the boys got heard the results of what had happened back in Europe. And they knew there was no going back. They knew their families, parents, grandparents, siblings, they were all killed. All killed in the concentration camps or, or killed right out on the streets. And so future memories, they did not go to Shanghai in 1940, bringing cameras, bringing uh, computers, bringing any technology. They thought that after a year or two, they, the war would be over and they'd be back home. And so all they had of their families were memories. And not just memories of mother and father, or sister or brother, they had memories of how did they smile? What was the sound of their voice? What was it like when they hugged you? And these became their future memories, as well as what happened in their lives during their lives in Shanghai. Not all, not all of it was good, but friendships were made that lasted after the war, but it was all to be future memories. And so when the war ended, they realized that they had to go on and look forward to the future, bring their memories with them. And some of them made it to America or to other countries. And basically that's the essence of the story about future memories. So if you have questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Bill, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I wanna welcome anyone who has questions to type your questions into the chat. And I also wanna welcome Ruthie Friedman to maybe unmute herself to join in this conversation. But uh, Bill, let me start by asking, is this the first book you've ever authored? Yes. This yes. is the first book that I've ever authored and had published. What was the experience like? For, uh, the, well, the, what, what happened is many years ago, I met a rabbi who told me he was one of those teenagers. And he told me only generalizations, meaning his description was when I was in Poland, I left and I went to Shanghai. It was terrible living there. I spent the war there. And then eventually I got to America. And he told me that story in like two minutes. He also said to me, if you can write a story about my life. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going into some of the minutia of what he told me that's in the book for the readers to find out for themselves. But the idea was I spent a few years doing the research because in the book, there is a lot of history and geography between them traveling from Poland to Shanghai, plus what life was like in Shanghai. So I read books on this, plus did a lot of historical studying. So it took me three or four years to put this all together and make it a hist uh, what I would call a historical novel, which basically that's what it is, an historical novel. Wow. Okay, we got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'll just jump right into these questions. Uh, first of all, why is it that Shanghai didn't require visas? I'm sorry? 
why is it that Shanghai didn't require visas? Oh, um, Shanghai was one, was a city that was always an open city worldwide for trade. And in, in the city, they had what, um, how to describe, what they called like a French concession, an international concession, a British concession, meaning they had uh, neighborhoods that were for the French, neighborhoods for the British, neighborhoods for other nationalities. And there was a lot of trade going on, which gets into a, another separate story because two Jewish families were very prominent in Shanghai. That was the Sassoon family and the Kaduri family. And they were doing a lot of business there and they had these different concessions which the Chinese allowed because the Chinese wanted this business. So therefore, when foreigners came to Shanghai, they said, come on in, you're more than welcome. Because when, when they did come in, it meant business for the city. And Shanghai was a very prosperous city prior to World War II. And the Japanese did not destroy or do major damage to Shanghai because they recognized how valuable that city was. Fascinating. Have you ever visited Shanghai? No. I have not visited Shanghai. You've been to so many countries, but... Uh... Well, it's a little bit tricky to go there because um, there are lots of restrictions now. Not talking... I'm not talking uh, virus restrictions. I'm talking political restrictions. Right. In other words, you just can't get off the plane in Shanghai, take a taxi to your hotel, and then let's say I'm going to take a walk over to uh, where the French concession was. Right. So most of the time, you have to have uh, tour guides. I see. Yeah. What was Jewish life for them when they were there uh, during the duration of, of the war? What, what, what kind of a Jewish life did they develop for themselves there? Well, what happened is at the very beginning, 1940, the Japanese were allies with the Germans, but the Japanese had not yet bombed Pearl Harbor. So from 1940 to 1942, the Jews could live anywhere they wanted in Shanghai if they had the money. And a lot of Jews, when they left Europe, brought money with them. And if they didn't have currency per se, they brought jewelry with them, which they would then sell to the Chinese. Then in 1942, things changed because the Japanese went to war with us and they, they, they had already been fighting against the Chinese for five years. And now they went and occupied Shanghai. And then that changed things because once they occupied and once the war was on, even the Japanese had problems getting supplies. So what the Japanese eventually did is they formed a ghetto or they forced the Jews into what we would call a ghetto. And all the Jews, regardless of where they were living in Shanghai, all had to live within a restricted area that I believe was like one square mile. And they had to live there for the duration of the war. And, and, that, and that also was the beginning of when illnesses took over, starvation took over. Starvation was very prominent in terms of what the Chinese and the Jews had to go through. And there were bodies lying on the streets just about every day. Wow. Not just one or two bodies, but this is what happened because also the diseases, they didn't, they weren't, there were no treatments supplied by the Japanese for the, for the diseases. So it was very bad, really bad from 1942 until the end of the war in 45. Wow. Do you have an estimate of how many Jews uh, survived by going through Shanghai? Yes. Um, well, first, 
th there are estimates as to how many were there. The estimates range from 18,000 up to 30,000. Nobody knows for sure because no one could take a census at that time, obviously. So this was all an estimate. But the idea being is that between 80 to 90% of the Jews there survived, which was a very high percentage considering what was going on in Poland, where these boys came from. Right. What was the name of the famous diplomat who helped? What was the name of the famous diplomat, Japanese national? Oh, Sugihara. So, yeah. yeah, Sugihara was the uh, Japanese consulate uh, in Lithuania. And he, going against Japanese orders, he was signing exit visas for Jews. And I believe he signed, I think, 6,000 as to where the Jews all went that we don't have a, a number on. But he signed 6,000 exit visas to get the Jews out of Lithuania. And then after a while, the Japanese came after him and made him go home to Japan. And he lost his position in, you know, with the consulate and the embassy and everything else. Right. How did many Jews stay in Shanghai? What's the community like today in Shanghai? I don't know. Can't tell you that. Yeah. Someone's asking if you know, ever met someone by the name of Helen Bix. She lived in Shanghai with her family during the wartime as a child. Helen Bix. Ruth, do you know her? You're shaking your head. Yes. Uh, I don't know her. No. Ruthie seems to know her. Ruthie, would you like to say something about her? Uh, no, I don't know her history. I do know I do know her, but I don't know her story. But I do have a question for my dad. Um, this is about the future memories part of the book. And in the book, you talk about a bucket of memories. And the main character, Joseph, throughout the story, keeps saying, I'm going to remember this. This will become a future memory. But then later in his life, he doesn't really pull those memories out of the bucket. So can you explain that a little bit, please? Um, the, uh, the idea is that think of our memories, your memories, and they're in a bucket. Now, if something happened today or yesterday, that memory is at the top of the bucket. But if something happened many, many years ago and you don't think about it often, it goes down to the bottom of the bucket and sometimes completely forgotten. So a simple example, you go and you take a trip with someone and uh, let's say you, uh, you go to Jerusalem and when you're there, you experience certain things. You come back from the trip and one person says, do you remember when we were there, we did this and saw that? And the other person says, no, I don't remember that. And then the other person will say, well, wait a minute, how about when we did this and did that? And the other one can say, no, I don't remember that. People remember different things in different ways and put it in their bucket. Now, if you're going to celebrate a birthday or if you're going to celebrate an anniversary and you say to the person or people who are there, let's always remember this celebration, you will. Because it may not be on the top of the bucket, but the emphasis is so strong that it'll always be able to be brought up from wherever it is. So years later, you can turn and say, do you remember when we had that special birthday party for so-and-so? And they said, oh yeah, I remember that, of course. That's what happens when it's sort of agreed upon that we'll always remember this. So it's a question of how you store your memories in your bucket, what you want to remember, what you don't want to remember. So that's the reference in the book by one of the uh, teenagers who's grown up and has memories, good ones, not so good ones.
It's interesting you say that, Bill, because I know you studied memory in college. In your bio, it said that you studied memory. Yes. Uh, but the Torah, actually, when the Jewish people left Egypt, Moshe told them right then and there, always remember this as a future memory. Never forget what happened right here. So he does exactly that tactic of reminding them to never forget what they experienced. And throughout the Torah, you have many instances where the Torah says, remember this, uh, the, your travels in the desert, remember the, what happened to Miriam. And uh, we have these constant reminders to remember in the future. Well, uh, actually, Passover for the, for the children is basically a memory course. When you think about it, if the child is five years old, four years old, you're saying to that child, I want you to remember this is what happened to our ancestors 3,000 years ago. And that child may not remember it at age three or four, but by the time the child is six or seven, they'll remember. They may not remember all the details. So every year they learn more details and they remember more. That's what happens as the memory develops. As, as people get older, memory develops so you, you can absorb more. Right. Um, with, with there being, like you said, somewhere around 20 to 30,000 Jews were in Shanghai during the war. Yes. I mean, what's, what remained of the ghetto today? Do you know, is it, you said the Jews were in the ghetto? I'm sorry, were the Jews where? Say, did, they, did they build synagogues or uh, yesh, did they start oh. yeshivot while they were oh. there? What did they? Yes. I mean, it's a lot what of Jews to accommodate. Is, um, um, they had a yeshiva there. I forgot the name of the yeshiva, but they had a yeshiva there. And many of the Jewish uh, teenagers went and studied there. Uh, and that was one way. And then they had a, f a, a few rabbis, but not many, but they really didn't have any synagogues, especially when they were put into the ghetto. Because the ghetto was just an area designated by the Japanese having nothing whatsoever to do with anything Jewish, nothing. Mm -hmm. So, and again, that ghetto was similar to the kind of ghettos that were in Europe. So for a Jew to get out of the ghetto, they had to have a pass to show to the Japanese guard who was standing at the gate. Hmm. Do you okay. know what? Do you know what's remained of the ghetto today? I'm sorry. What's remained today? I'm sorry. Today. I, I'm. I'm not. I'm not follow do, that. Do you know whether anything has remained of that ghetto? Is that still a? Uh, oh. I don't know. I don't know. But there are people I know who have been to Shanghai and they said they still have a few Jewish relics around the city. Uh, they didn't get into the detail, but they said that there's not much left. The, the, the Chinese destroyed most of it. Wow. Yeah, well, they, because they, they, no, no, religion, no religion basically is allowed in China now. Do you know if the survivors who, who survived thanks to Shanghai ever showed some kind of public recognition or gratitude to Shanghai or any kind of a monument or tribute that was ever made to the Chinese government in recognition of those lives that were saved? I, I, I never heard of that. And the other thing is that um, one of the reasons that prompted me to write the book was that I think that many Jews don't know that Jews survived in Shanghai during World War II. The, the emphasis of studying World War II for Jews is the Holocaust. And this is completely away from the Holocaust. This has nothing to do with Europe other than fleeing from Europe to, to try to get to Shanghai to survive the war, which most of them did survive the war. They might have been uh, uh, on the verge of starvation or they might have had diseases, 
but most of them survived the war and then went on to places like Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada. You know, they went to different countries after, and starting around 1946, even though the war ended in 45. Interesting. There's a fascinating question here uh, being asked. Did the Nazis try to force the Japanese to persecute the Jews in Shanghai? Uh, no, they did not. Because the, the, the story that I read, which I mentioned, and I'll be happy to mention again, is the, the Nazis, the German Nazis, told their allies, get rid of all the Jews. And the Japanese sent them to Shanghai. And the reason that that happened is in 1905, when the Japanese were going to go to war against Russia in what's called the Sino-Russo War, the Japanese needed money. And the Japanese went all around the world asking for money, asking for loans. And every place they went, except one person, turned them down. And the one person was a Jewish banker from London. Can't remember his name right now, but it might have been, it might have been a Rothschild. And they gave Japan money. And the Japanese used that money to defeat the Russians. It was the first time in history that an Asian country defeated a European country. And to this day, in a cemetery, I believe outside of Tel Aviv, I don't know which cemetery, there's I think a Japanese general who's buried there. I don't know if Rabbi, if you heard about this, but when Japanese go to Israel, they always go to that cemetery and pay their respects to this fallen Japanese uh, leader. So, I don't know, in Shanghai, it is located at the former synagogue. Ah, okay. That's good to know. I'm glad they have that. Yeah, it's important. Have you researched if there are other books on the story of the refugees in Shanghai? Oh, yes. Um, I, there, there are at least four or five that I've read about, you know, sh Jews in Shanghai and getting visas to leave countries and things like that. I, I could send you the list if you would like. Okay. I mean, not now. Right. Um, so besides that rabbi you met, have you met many other descendants of those refugees? No. He's the only one I ever met. And I was told that, um, what's her name in our synagogue? Um, Coppell. Right. I think she's, a, uh, she was, a, uh, or her parents. Her father. Survivors from Shanghai. Yes, her father. I don't know if she's on the Zoom tonight, but yeah, I believe her father uh, survived through Shanghai, is right. Yes. Um, I believe so. Um, yeah, her family came through China like that. Um, it's quite I have bad. another question for you. Um, please tell us which parts of the book are actually happened, which parts were true. What, uh, what part of the book actually happened? Which parts, yes. Oh, well. Um, a very good question. Leaving Poland actually happened. And then the traveling happened, but I fictionalized a lot of the uh, things that happened along the way. And then life in Shanghai really happened in terms of what, uh, which I've written in the book about what was going on in the streets on a daily basis about how uh, the American Air Force wanted to bomb out a Japanese facility in Shanghai and they missed. And some of the bombs landed into the Jewish ghetto. So all those things are, are, are true and I've written them in the book. And then the other things that are true was towards the ending about the survival, how they survived and what happened to some of them uh, in, in, in terms of 
life after 1946. All, and basically, a lot of that was based on the truth of Jews leaving Shanghai in 1946, and they never came back. The ones that, you know, I, I was told about never returned to Shanghai when, because of what the experience was like. Bill, now that you've written your first book, uh, do you think you're going to write a second book? Uh, yes, I'm already I'm already on to that already, but uh, a completely different kind of this is historical fiction, and the one I'm working on is pure fiction. Uh, uh, the the idea being of uh, the Russians wanting to take over the whole Middle East, including Israel, Jordan. Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and a former KGB agent is working with the Russian officials to do it. And his cousin, who's Russian, is working on behalf of Israel to undo it. And that's the, uh, the conflict of the story. Total fiction, right. not based on anything true at all. Well, your, your first book took you three years? Yes. Do you think with experience now it'll take a little less time? Oh yeah, the, the writing pure fiction without having to look up all the history and geography is much easier, really, much easier. Right. And then the other thing is uh, I'm also writing uh, an autobiography because uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Ruthie, my daughter, took us to a book club and the person who was the speaker was a survivor of Buchenwald concentration camp. And there were about 40 or 50 people in the audience. And he said to the audience or asked the audience, how many of you would like a biography written by your grandparents or your great grandparents? And everybody there raised their hand. And then he asked, and how many of you have such a biography written by your grandparents or great grandparents? Nobody. He said, why don't you go and write one? It won't just be for your children and your grandchildren, but it'll be for generations on that'll want to know what life was like when you were growing up when you were grown up, what was life all about? Because as I know personally, when my grandparents came to America in the early 1900s, they never ever spoke about their life in Europe, ever. They never mentioned their family. They came here when they were teenagers. They never mentioned family. They never mentioned past history, but I think I know what motivated them because in 1903 in Russia, in the town of Kishniev, they had one of the worst pogroms in Russian history. And that word spread all around Europe. So my grandparents who were teenagers living in Poland, living in Romania, heard that and within two, three years they said goodbye to their families and came to America. So that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a, an important uh, thing to do, obviously, to share the the Torah says, uh, ask your father and he will tell you your grandparents and they will re relate to you. So we always like to learn from the past. Yes, absolutely. If there's the anyone out there that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, but one, one of the things is um, when we talk about memory, think of like uh, playing a, 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 a CD or playing a record or playing a tape or something and your memory has a lot of things in it. But a lot of times the unpleasant things you don't want to play again. You remember it but you don't want to think about it. You don't want to talk about it. It's too uncomfortable. It's too sad. And so it's never to be discussed. 
And that's what they've said uh, about Holocaust survivors in general. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. And some who do, do it when they're much, much older. And again, what my grandparents went through, I don't know. But it couldn't have been good for them to pick up and leave Romania and Poland when they were teenagers and just say goodbye to everybody. And a lot of that, their family, they never saw again either. Thanks. So they came to America, which was better than Shanghai, but still they had to say goodbye to their family. And some came over eventually and some never came over. And then those were killed during World War II right. or even World War I because they had a big plague in Europe in World War I. Right. Um, for those out there that are listening tonight and are inspired to write their own autobiography, having just published the book and gone through the process, do you have any tips or advice of how to go about doing it? Yes, um, I, was, I was just recently asked, uh, as Ruthie remembers, by a fifth grade teacher in West Palm Beach, whose uh, class I addressed. And that is, if you wanna write an autobiography, don't say to yourself, Ay vey, it's gonna take me so many hours. No, don't think that way. Sit down and write for 15, 20 minutes and do it three, four times a week, 15, 20 minutes. So it won't disrupt your normal schedule, but every time you write 15, 20 minutes, at the end of the week, you wrote an hour and a half and you keep on writing every week, an hour and a half, two hours, you'll finish the book. So it may take longer than you think, but the thing that nobody knows is how long a autobiography is gonna be anyway. Because the, the, the person who had asked that question of us had said, suppose your grandparents or great grandparents had written their autobiography and suppose it was 750 pages. Would anybody say it was too long? And everybody shook their head. No. So when you, when my advice, if you want to write the autobiography, a little bit every day, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just get into the habit that I'm going to be writing and you write three, four, five times a week. And it becomes a habit to write. And the more you do it that way, then the more things you're going to remember also, because the way memory works is you'll think back to your childhood and you'll think back and you'll say, oh, I remember when my grandmother did such and such. And you'll write it all down. And two days later, all of a sudden you'll say, oh, wait, I also remember when she did such and such in addition to that. And then you'll add it to what you wrote two days before. Because once you start recollecting, you'll start thinking of more things and more things and, uh, I want to tell you, I find it more difficult to write an autobiography than to write a fiction. Fiction, you can make up the whole thing any way you want. But when you're doing an autobiography, memory keeps on coming back at you and you start to remember things that you never thought of that you didn't even know you remembered. And all of a sudden, you'll remember it. And that's how memory works. Beautiful. Did you have to interview anyone about this book, Future Memories? Did you inter do any uh, interviews? No, I, no, I didn't. All the research was mine. Very nice. I just want to turn to Ruthie uh, to join yeah. in for a moment. Ruthie? Yes. Um, uh, tell, tell us uh, what you and your children's reaction have been to this book. Well, my dad gave a presentation to my book club a couple months ago and the kids all watched and I think they're interested and I think they're also impressed that their grandpa has, is a published author now. And I also want to share that my sister Betty is on the call as well. Oh, so hi, Betty. Happy that she's here with us too and we have some relatives on so we're happy to have them as well as to see members of the congregation and the community. But to answer your question, yes, I think the kids are impressed with their grandpa. <laughs> 
And as Thank Betty, you. do you want to Thank say you. hello, Betty? You have to unmute yourself. Betty, Betty. Unmute. There you go. Hi, thank you. First of all, congratulations, a big congratulations to my father. I am so proud and impressed with his efforts to uh, write such a beautiful book on so many levels. I thank you. I appreciate it. She may have frozen for a second. Frozen. Yeah. Think for now she's on, wait, Betty, are you frozen or unfrozen? I think she's frozen. Okay, but we heard the main gist of it, that she's very proud of her father. That's the main thing, right? And one last question. Uh, how much help did you get from Rana? From, from Rana? Um, well, two, two, two pluses. One plus was, that if I had a question about something in terms of, should this be in the book or should this not be in the book? Should I edit it out or keep it in? She would give me her point of view on it and why. And then the second thing was, which is a big plus also, is sometimes I was so concentrated that I couldn't be interrupted. So I would say to Rana, leave me alone for about an hour. And she would. <laughs> and for one hour, she answered the phone, took care of whatever had to be taken care of, because it's a lot of brain function when you're doing the writing and the editing, really. Yes. A lot. And also, uh, one thing to mention, which I didn't mention before, um, the book was professionally edited at one time. There was uh, a woman that I had met and she was working as an editor for Simon and & Schuster. And she said for a certain amount of money, she would edit the book. And I learned a lot, which I could, I could tell in a very brief, brief summary of what she said. And that is, when you're going to write something, don't be superfluous. Stick to the point. That's it. And... The book that I wrote, the book that is published, about five chapters were cut out at the end because she said, you're writing a second book. You're writing about what happened after the war. The book is about what happened in Shanghai during the war and how some of them survived. That's the story. She said, don't tell a another story about what happens when they survive in America or wherever, and she's right. So the idea is when you write, stick to the point, keep it short to the point, and just don't put extra things in that are not necessary, right. which I mean happens lots of times. It happens with movies, it happens in books, it happens in speeches, superfluous things are thrown in. And the answer is, does it add to the point you're trying to make? And that's what I learned. And, and for me, that was a big learning experience. Right. Uh, that, that, that's very important. You know, they say a good sermon has a good opening, a good closing, and the two are close together. That's right. <laughs> that's, isn't that the joke on giving a good speech, right? That's the joke on giving a speech. Um, right. I, someone's saying a question, uh, uh, Sugihara defied the Japanese. Yes, he did. He forged these passports. Uh, but, you know, that's a civil disobedience. Uh, sometimes it's called for, obviously, to save lives. Uh, to Certain laws are meant to be kept and others are meant to be broken in the case of uh, saving lives. Just like the, the midwives in Egypt saved the lives of the Jewish babies and defied the Egyptian authorities. Uh, sometimes you're not supposed to uh, follow order, so to speak. Um, the question that's being asked is, uh, what was the, uh, maybe you could comment on this bill as well, um, Sugihara, what was his motivation? Was it just because he was uh, altruistic, he was a righteous person, a righteous Gentile, or was there any other motivation? He was a very righteous man really that's why he did it 
because he saw no, because number one, he knew about what the Nazis were doing. So although he was working for a country that was a German ally and the Japanese were not doing what the Nazis and were doing, he was very righteous and his I, idea was there's no reason for these people to be killed. This, they're not in the war, which they weren't. The Jews were not in the war. The armies were in the war. So when the Germans are fighting against the Americans or the British or the Australians, they're fighting soldiers to soldiers. But the Germans deliberately went out of their way, as you all know, killing Jews. And Sugihara said, this isn't right. I'm going to save them. And he wrote these visas. I mean, he was working I, from one book I read. I think he was working like 18 or 20 hours a day writing out the visas because, again, no technology. So therefore, every visa had to be handwritten. And he wrote 6,000. So that's what happened. And as I said, then they transferred him. And um, many years ago, uh, Ruthie, you remember, I can't tell you what year, we were in Chabad in Lexington, Massachusetts. And we met Sugihara's wife and son. Remember that, Ruthie? Ruthie, you hear me? I hear you. No, um, no I'm sorry, I don't. You don't remember? Oh, okay. But anyway, it was a long time ago, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a long time ago. And but it was in Lexington, Massachusetts. And we met his wife. And that she said, and then her son said about the husband fa and father, how he was such a good humanitarian, always trying to help people, always doing the best he could to help people. And that's what he accomplished when he was in Lithuania during World War II. And I'll send you a book uh, about him. I'll send you the title of a book about him, okay? Well, thank you, Bill, for writing the book and for uh, talking to us tonight about the book. Uh, and we're looking forward to your next uh, title, God willing, soon. And Thank uh, you, thank you. I appreciate uh, your, your concern and your help in uh, the, you know promoting this evening and uh, uh, look forward to book number two sooner than later. Okay. Thank you, Fascinating. Someone commented that they went online during the presentation and bought your book on Amazon. Oh, thank you. Very, I'm very happy to hear that. Is that yeah, the best Am place to buy it? Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, and then if uh, they like the book, I would appreciate writing, having them write a review, and send it to Amazon. There are already some reviews on Amazon about the book. Okay, good. Okay. Well, thank so you, thank Bill. you again. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay, thank you all. Okay, good, good night. night. Good night, thank you, bye.